Here we go. All right. Well, welcome. This is a webinar about coding in the classroom. And I'm my name is Nikki Vredenberg, and I'm here with Jason Greenwald. We'll get to our introductory slide here. Um, I work with Montana PBS on a grant funded program to bring professional development to rural teachers. Um, Jason, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you. Nikki. I am Jason Greenwald. I work for the Bozeman Public Library. I am a K-8 certified teacher. I've taught uh, all those grades, library and technology, and uh, I am also a former computer programmer. Cool, and Jason and I used to work together at Lamont School um, when I was teaching kindergarten and first grade, and Jason was the library and technology specialist out there. We started coding together with little people. I don't know, was that like five years ago now? I don't even remember. Yeah, probably about five <laughs> years. Um, and so we had a lot of fun, and we've been taking that act on the road for a while and sharing what we learned through that process um, and the mistakes we made along the way. Um, and so we put together a, a workshop, and the resources for this workshop can be found here at this bit.ly uh, code webinar. Um, we're also recording this because there are currently no live participants, but we hope that um, other people will find us on YouTube and learn from this recording. We'll go viral. Yeah, <laughs> anyway, I'm sure of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this whole slide deck is at that bit.ly and all of the resources that we have linked up here there. Our intention today in, in webinar format, we can't do much for hands-on um, instruction, but we can give an introduction to, of, to coding for those who are new. We'll do a little demonstration of a couple of the resources that teachers can use and just show you just how easy it is to get your kids started. Um, Jason's gonna tap into his um, old job description and give you some coding language fundamentals and just some of the language the words that you'll use with your students we'll show you how you can meet standards in both common core and national Gen next generation science standards we'll give you a ton of resources that will work across uh, many many devices for grades k and eight k through eight is our focus but really you could code with even senior citizens can code you know it's that it's that easy and it's that fun so all ages can be successful we're actually we're actually teaching a class at the library of course now i that i say that i realize this will be dated and <laughs> but but in in a week or so we're doing an hour of code event for grown-ups Awesome. Awesome. I think, I think we're learning a lot about just how easy it is. And I think everybody's kind of jumping on the bandwagon. Um, and then at the end, um, anybody who watches this recording can fill out an evaluation and we can send you some, uh, an hour of OPI renewal credit. So we'll move on here. Um, I guess I should present mode here. There we go. So in my um, experience when we're working with kids in technology the there are two ways you can do this you can use direct instruction and show them how to do things and then you can let them loose in a sandbox kind of environment and let them play and so I always say you need to have a little bit of direct instruction so you can show them what to do how to log in um, maybe how to troubleshoot a thing or two and then release them into the sandbox to figure it out. Um, and then after a while, you might want to stop them, bring them back to direct instruction and show them how to do something and then let them play again. Coding is one of those things where it really can be done in the sandbox uh, for most of the time. If you want to take them to that next level and have them really refine their skills, you want to add some direct instruction here and there. But the tools we're going to show you are really great for just getting them set up and letting them go. And that's how we've, a little bit how we've structured our trainings in the past. So we're going to um, 
I don't think I'll show this video, Jason. <laughs> okay. You and I have both seen it. I respect um, that. So this is a great video that if you're you're tuning in um, and watching the recording, just uh, click on this link. And basically, this is a great video from the code.org website that identifies several careers that use coding in the fashion industry, the medical industry, agriculture, energy, public safety, um, and just really establishes relevance for why it's important to teach the coding language to students. So I'm going to switch over and stop sharing my screen. Oh, Kim is here. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Good to see you. Sorry, I had to get the kids on the bus. I understand. Jason and I were just doing the recording, and now we have a live participant. So that's so nice. <laughs> I think maybe we'll show the video now. Jason, what do you think? I think we should. Yeah. Okay. So Encore Jason, Kim, Kim, Jason. Hi, Kim. Um, nice to meet you. Nice to Kim, meet you, too. Kim is an awesome second grade teacher out at Amsterdam. Oh, and great. She let me take over her class yesterday and do a breakout EDU. And we had a, so much fun. It's been, she's been really kind to let me into her classroom a lot this year. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. So Kim, we were just talking about, I'll back up just because there's no reason not to. Um, we've got the slides we're going to be going for, going through are at this link right here. So if you're on a different device or if you want to open another tab, we have bit.ly slash code webinar. And so this, this whole Google slide deck will be there for you okay. and you can click on the links um, and get to mo most of the resources that we're going to be finding okay. and we're just going to show this video see if it works that is a good one for helping your kids see um, just how important coding is and why it's a, a great idea to teach coding I think 19th century was about the industrial revolution, about electricity, about disrupting the agricultural society and making it more advanced. The 20th century was about physics and engineering to do more things easier in our everyday life from refrigerators to washing machines. And the 21st century is definitely the digital age. It's the internet. Even if you want to become a race car driver or play baseball um, or, uh, you know, build a house, all of these things have been turned upside down by software. The Lettuce Spot is a robot that can sense its environment every single hour. This lettuce bot is seeing 1.5 million plants and it's taking individual action on those plants. We enable lettuce growers to have higher yields in their fields by helping make it cheaper, by helping produce food in a more sustainable way. And that wasn't previously possible without computer science and technology. I have a really fun job where we build polyvore, which kind of combines all my favorite things, so programming as well as fashion and art and design and shopping. <laughs> Half the products you use these days are software products that you play with on maybe your phone. And so if you want to build something cool, you need to know programming, right? And there's so many things that you can do with computer science. So if you just work backwards from the cool thing that you want to build and figure out what that is, a lot of times computer programming is part of that, right? So you should learn the skills. It's really exciting right now. The technology that we're developing right now is going to be used by your doctor in, you know, in the next decade. When you come into the office and you're sick, the doctor is going to be like, all right, you know, spit in this cup. <laughs> and I will put it into this magic machine, which is the sequencer. And in an hour, I can tell you what you have or what's wrong with you. So if we're looking for a new virus, for example, we'll download a database of all the viruses that are known. And we'll search for, you know, our sequence of interest against a whole database of all viruses. So you still need somebody to analyze the data. <laughs> the computer is not smart enough yet. 
Our software helps people save energy and thereby reduce their carbon emissions. To date, we've saved over eight terawatt hours, which is the equivalent of about 1.1 million cars on the road. When you're forecasting the wind, there's so many different parameters that go into it. It would be impossible for a human to sit down and do all those calculations. We need a computer model in order to forecast it. <laughs> I write software which scans images, looking for bad images, images that we know are illegal. I work very closely with organizations like the National Center for Missing Children. I know that the work that we've done has impacted the life of children. And I feel really strongly about it because there's a lot of social problems right now that could really leverage the use of technology. It's a lot about empowering the people who are there helping the world by giving them the tools to be able to do better. That's something that we can do right now, and the tools available are quite huge. The merging of art and technology is getting more and more significant now. Because computers and software are such an integral part of our lives day to day, people are realizing that it can be quite creative to take this medium of computers and create incredible works of art. In Finding Nemo, when Crush and Squirt and all the friends are flying through the East Australian current, you're seeing images of water flowing by, you're seeing the colors on the back of the turtle, you're seeing the sides of the fish. All of those things are generated through math and computer programs that we write that we then give to the artists and they take that to, to create that final image and tweak it and make it look beautiful and look fun. The crux of it is really about invention. It's about looking at the world and, and being dissatisfied with things and questioning everything. I always felt like if I didn't learn how to program, it, it would be like not learning how to read. You know, the, the future would just be closed to me. If you're in the coding profession, there's so many things that you can do and you can pretty much pick and choose the course you want to be in. I think that I mean, you can start something in your college dorm room and you can have a set of people who haven't built a big company before come together and build something that a billion people use as part of their, their daily lives is, is just crazy to think about, right? It's really, it's humbling and it's amazing. Really, it's about the chance to reinvent things and then see it out there in the world and see people using it and having fun or having a better life because of something that wasn't there before that you put in the world. <laughs> All right. I love that video because of all the different careers um, you can see represented that use coding, um, things you never thought of. Um, some of the, when we did the coding workshop last week, it's the participants shared things that surprised them. Um, and agriculture was one that we was shared that was surprising. Kim, was there one there that surprised you? Yeah, that was one. And just the medical implications, you know, it, you hear about it, but then you look at it and it's like, some of this is in science fiction movies. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you're like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. But that's the world we live in now. Yeah. How, how nice would it be to actually just have them put your saliva in a machine and tell you what you have? I don't no. think they'll have that service at urgent care anytime soon. <laughs> 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 All right, so I'm actually, I think now is the part where I stop sharing and hand it to Jason, right? That's right. Okay. Thank you. So let me share my screen. So what I want to do for the next few minutes is uh, just talk a little bit about some of the principles of computer coding so that, so that someone, if, if you haven't already uh, worked with coding with students you it uh, is demystified some and uh, you can see just how approachable it is and so I'm going to start by just uh, going into code.org and pulling up one of their modules one of their tutorials to show you how easy it is to use and then I'm just going to very quickly review some different uh, computer coding principles and uh, so that you can see just how approachable the topic is and how there's there's really nothing about it that's um, out of reach for anybody. So uh, I will go ahead and do that. So I, I just want to confirm, can you all see code.org? 
up on your screen? Okay. Yep. <clears throat> All right. You can see Russell Wilson <laughs> <laughs> gazing into your eyes. <laughs> All right. <I'm> gonna <laughs> oh, maybe you don't see it that way. Uh, so I'm going to click the start button here. And that hour of code is here. So I'm going to click start. And there are there are a lot of activities here at this website. I have found personally that if I come over to the created by drop down menu and choose code.org, it narrows the list down significantly to some to really these the the top row and and these two, the code with Anna and Elsa and write your first computer program. These five are really great basic tutorials. And uh, the Minecraft Hour of Code, if we click on that and then click the short link to go to it, or I guess we could choose start, um, it will take us to three different, three different modules. So I'm just gonna click on Minecraft Adventurer and a video will start up. I'll just cancel that. And so you'll be asked to choose Steve or Alex. I'll choose Steve. And at a second, move forward, command to reach the sheep. I'm also going to see if I can, I'll, I'll let the music play. I don't want to mess with it. So I just want to show you the basic layout here. All of these modules use the same layout in this area up up here, here I'm gonna I'm gonna annotate. Nice. Are you seeing? I don't know. To me, it just looks like it. I scribbled on the screen. Okay. <laughs> it's a big loopy circle. Okay. Oh, yeah. It. <laughs> that area is where the instructions are given to the participant. Uh, over here, I don't know if I. Over here. Uh, are your blocks that you can use. So these are the different commands that you can add to your program. And I'm starting to get, uh, I'm starting to get self-conscious about the, <laughs> the annotation. It's okay, it's better than second graders. You're doing oh, fine. okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna do, I'm gonna do a, some drawing here. So this area here is the, where your program is built. So you drag blocks into this window like so and then add to your program um, this block right here the when run is an event <clears throat> so it just really in english language it means when we click the run button to start our program we're going to execute these steps and you can pull them apart and they're very easy to manipulate um, i want to sorry the oh i can change this okay for um, anyone who's interested, there's also a button here that you can click and it'll show you the code that's actually writing behind there. And um, I'll note too that the Star Wars tutorial has an option where you can, instead of dragging these blocks that have kind of pseudo code or, or pseudo language where it's just kind of in plain speak says what's going on, it actually has blocks that contain coding elements, uh, actual syntax that um, more advanced users might enjoy. Um, that, that, or you can do the show code option here. So once you have what's in, what you need in place, you just click run. And here is your program window right here. It runs right above that button. And I, I meet my sheep. And if you want, after the fact, you can see that, again, the code that was written out, this is JavaScript, those are functions. So, anywho, so uh, you just continue on like that. And as you progress, oh, deep music, can you hear that? The? No. No, okay, just me, good, I'm glad. <laughs> um, <laughs> it sounded so serious all of a sudden, like, uh, so, so as you progress through uh, these different, I'm going to close that. I'm sorry, the music was too intense for me. 
as you progress through the different modules, you, um, pardon me, you, you are introduced to some of these other coding concepts that I'm about to cover. Things like loops, for example. So you've got a block of code, some, some instructions for the computer, and you need to do them more than once. It's more efficient to have them in a loop and, and run them over and over than it is to write them out for every single, um, every single action that you need to take. Okay, I'm going to switch to slides. I still have all these drawings all over my screen. What, what does it look like to you? Same? Yep. All right. Well, have you switched to slides yet, though? I, I, ha I haven't switched to the slides yet. Okay. I'm just okay. going to click annotate and clear all. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, that was... I was totally unprepared for the music. It, it sounded like I was delivering terrible news to someone. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm glad you didn't hear it. Okay. All right. So you should see a slide now that says coding language 101. So, yep. All right. Great. So I'm just going to kind of talk through these real quick. Um, if you want me to repeat something or ask a question, please let me know. The number one thing that I try to impart to students is that computers are not particularly smart, and I'll, I'll give you an example of that in a minute, but, but uh, computer program is like a recipe. It's a set of instructions that have to be given in the right order uh, in order for the computer to understand it, and so that's just something that I, I find relatable. I show students uh, at my hour of code sessions, I show them a recipe for chocolate chip cookies, and I think we did that too. Nikki, yeah. and, and that's something they can understand. Um, what they don't always understand, and I always try to point out, is that, that uh, a cook, a person following a recipe has intelligence and agency, and they can make changes or notice mistakes or correct mistakes, but a computer can't. And that's a, kind of a new concept. So the computer will do exactly what you tell it to do, nothing more, nothing less. And if you tell it to do the wrong thing, it will do the wrong thing and it won't work. And so that's kind of a new, new concept sometimes for students, uh, but it helps with uh, precision, it helps. With, so for example, math, computational precision, or in areas of English uh, language arts, things like uh, punctuation for example, atten that attention to detail. Uh, I'm going to, I have to show this photo. <clears throat> this is my, the passenger seat of my car. And I, I like to show this to prove that computers aren't smart. When I go fill up my water uh, for the week, I put it on the passenger seat and it has a sensor in it that tells the computer in the car that I have a passenger. Well, of course, I don't have a passenger. So, uh, but to fool it, to make it stop beeping the whole way home, I buckle it up. And so the point is just that you can, <laughs> you can outsmart a computer. Um, it only knows, you know, what, what we tell it to do. Um, and I think that's also an important lesson for students. Uh, although last night, it was funny, I was I, I talked about that issue and I said, computers can't think. And then of course, the, like a fifth grader said, not yet. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, all right, yeah. fair enough. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> until we get there. Uh, so next I wanna talk about conditions. This is, again, this is logic. This is something that we all do every day. We don't think about it. We don't call it conditions, or we may not call it Boolean logic or anything like that, but we make decisions based on information that we have. And one, one analogy I like to share is that I live in Livingston, so I have to drive 25 miles to get to Bozeman to get to work. And I always check the weather each day. And if it's snowing or it has snowed overnight, I decide to leave about 10 minutes early, earlier than usual to get to work because I know it's gonna take longer to drive. So that's the condition is there's snow on the ground. The decision that I make is, is to leave early. And we, we do that 
all the time. In computer terms, I'm going to show you some code in a little bit here that will will show that. Um, but we usually in encoding those present themselves as if then else statements. If some condition is true, then do this. Else otherwise do some other thing or do nothing at all. Okay. So uh, next I'm going to talk about loops and really just um, just a, a very basic concept. You're, you're doing something, um, say you're, uh, you're checking, um, actually scratch that idea. So it's, you have a set of instructions that you repeat over and over. You could, and let's say there are five steps in, that, in those instructions. You could every day, so you have to execute this every day, every day you could write them out, or you could do, put them in something called a loop, and that's just where you execute it some number of times over and over and over. And the nice thing about a loop is that once, once the instructions are in a loop, you can easily change it so that it runs 10 times or 1,000 times. And it takes only a little bit of work to increase the power there. Um, and functions are not unlike loops in that you have a set of instructions that you repeat. But <coughs> functions, we, we usually give them a name. And uh, so with students, I like to talk about the, you know, get ready for bed. When someone says get ready for bed, they, they mean some other stuff with that, right? That usually means brushing your teeth, it means reading a book, putting on pajamas, but we don't say all those things every night because doing so would become tiresome. So we, we have this phrase, get ready for bed, and that's basically what a function is. So when we say these words, get ready for bed, we know it means do these other things. And um, the, the nice thing about a function, especially when you get into code, is that it's reusable. You can use it from all sorts of, if you build it once, but then you can use it from all sorts of other, <clears throat> other programs and, and files. And it's, again, one of those things that makes coding uh, powerful and it makes it easy to solve, easier to solve problems. Uh, last, I want to mention in events and I guess not last, sorry, second to last, events and inputs. So in the Hour of Code Minecraft example, there was a block and it said when run and we talked about that is an event. When you click the run button, that is an event. And so it will execute that code once the event occurs. Another event that you might be familiar with is if you rotate your iPad and you haven't locked the, um, the direction it's going, it'll, your screen will rotate, right? That's an event. Something happened there. Um, you click a button. You say, hey, Google. Is that the phrase? <laughs> hey, Google. That's an event, <clears throat> right? And that kicks yeah. off some code that says, oh, what would you like to know, Mr. Greenwald? No, they, Google's never been that polite to me. But anyway, <laughs> um, and then, of course, inputs you have. That's just getting information um, from, from something. So, like, a, I, I think of a web page, you know, you might, um, you, you are going to put in credit card information, for example. You type that in. That's an input. And then the, the computer will do something with that information. Uh, the other thing that the last box here, the rest, um, is more just a, a few little things that I want to talk about that, that uh, are part of writing computer code and part of, of um, doing these tutorials, but uh, they're not print standalone principles per se, but really all, all the reason why you write code or the reason why you practice these tutorials is to help with problem solving, right? In the Minecraft tutorial, there was a problem. Steve needed to go two block or two steps in order to meet up the sheep. I'm not sure what they were going to discuss, but that was the problem that you had to solve. And and so um, last night I, I was thinking about this uh, because Nikki and I have experienced this with her students. Oh, there go the lights. <laughs> I knew that. 
I was afraid. <laughs> That's terrible. I, I'm not given a real office. So. Um, anyway, uh, there was a student who was working out, and she was she was tr going through a tutorial. It was a Star Wars tutorial, and it had a bunch of intricate steps where she was moving R two D two up and over and up and over and. And she was struggling and we got out a piece of paper and a pen and she started writing down each individual step as kind of a way to deal with the, the problem of what is it that I'm trying to do. And it builds that, pro that muscle of uh, the problem solving muscle and it helps. And it also teaches them that, teaches students that they, it's okay to fail and that you're gonna try things um, and see what works. And if it doesn't work, you might try something else and you may not even know if it's gonna work or not and to get comfortable with that idea um, and fixing things. So those are lessons that can be applied to so many areas of school. I mean, really everything um, and how we learn. Um, and I think those those are the, the benefits, you know, of teaching code. Um, more than anything else, just all those all those different uh, skills that that get honed as a result. Mm -hmm. So I showed you my water, and now I'm just gonna switch over here to this little bit of code here. This is in a coding language called PHP. I didn't really make the distinction, but um, the principles that we talked about there, like loops and functions and uh, conditions, those all apply to all, all the programming languages. Um, but the languages themselves, they have their own individual, their, their own unique syntax that you have to learn. They're very similar, but, um, but the, the things I talked about before were kind of universal. Um, here is some specific code, and just to, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go down the annotate road here again, but, I'm gonna use this box here. So this is a condition or a conditional, that's what it's called. And right here, it's just saying, if the variable weather is equal to one, then I want you to write out this HTML right here, which is, says rain. And then if, if it isn't one, which it'll only be a one or a zero because I've set that, it'll write out this, this, this statement right here. So there you go. So there's, if this is true, do this. Otherwise, else, do this, okay? And so there it is in a nutshell. Um, and I didn't even mention variables, but that's another mathematical concept and abstraction, of course, that, that comes out of working with code. So I just wanted to, to show that so you could see that in action. And I'm going to clear. I'm the worst. I'm saying everything as I do it. <laughs> Sorry. It's good. Is we're, there... all... <laughs> <laughs> we're all used to that. <laughs> uh, okay. And then I just want to see. Okay. And then um, did you want me to talk about this, Nikki, or did you want to go ahead and I can talk about this. So this okay. is just, um, these are three things that are in blue are hyperlinked to some other documents that reference coding in standards. So if you clink, you click, clink. If you click meet standards by coding, it's gonna open you up a Google doc that has aligned the K through eight common core standards for both math and English language arts um, and showing you just how you can meet those standards by doing coding activities in your classroom. And basically anywhere in the common core standards where the word digital appears, um, coding easily fits into that because this is a digital task. And so if it's students are composing or, or using digital tools to write stories, um, coding fits into that. If students are using digital tools to solve problems, coding fits well into that. Um, we also have speaking and listening, reading informational text, narrative text, um, fundamentals of language and writing. Um, all of those are skills that we can meet just by putting kids in scenarios where they're using coding. Um, the Common Core ELA link will take you to a blog post written by 
technology coach who actually works in Taiwan, I think, um, in an English language school. And it's all about um, ELA standards that you meet doing coding. And you know, I always thought of coding as a math and science skill. And I've recently looked at some of the storytelling elements that come along with coding. I was in Angela Bergantine's classroom today in Amsterdam, and she's got sixth graders using Tinker to animate characters um, expressing what happened during the Neolithic era. And so it's a caveman who thinks, hmm, this hunting thing isn't working out very well. Maybe we should start domesticating animals. And then a lion appears and chases the caveman, and the caveman turns around, and the kids had to code in the caveman reacting to that scene. Um, and so it was a storytelling element. They had to add a background. They had to give the character dialogue, and Tinker allowed them to type in the dialogue that the characters said. So while they were doing coding, but they were also using history principles, um, and storytelling uh, to connect to what they were learning in her library classes, which is just, it's just brilliant. I can't wait for them to finish. So that's what this slide is. Um, Jason, go ahead and push moving on to the next one if you want. You, you know what? I, I'm willing to stop sharing. <laughs> You're willing to give up your control of the screen? <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah. Okay, all right. it's all you. <laughs> and I'll start sharing. And... Uh, and while you're doing that, I just, I, one thing that I love is about coding is that it's iterative. You're never done. You're always tweaking things. And it's so perfect for writing because when I was growing up in the school, you know, you would be given a writing assignment, you complete it, and it was done. You never revisited that. But now we're starting to look at writing as this iterative process that, you know, take another look at it. Let's see if we can improve things uh, over and over. And this models that uh, behavior mm -hmm. perfectly. Absolutely. Um, we're also seeing connections to the next generation science standards. And it came up in our workshop last week by one of the participants that I hadn't really thought about it, but there are practice standards in the next generation standards, just like there are math practice standards. And a lot of them, this is a nice visual showing that when we analyze data and we use models and simulation, that is coding. Um, and so we can easily spend some time having the kids write computer language and know that we're meeting science standards as well, which I think the NGSS for me was, was quite daunting um, and felt like, oh boy, this is a lot to learn. <laughs> this is in kind of a different way to teach science. Um, knowing that I could do it with some coding would, would really help, <laughs> would have really helped. Um, and then, oh, I should go back. Down here, there's a link um, to an Ed Surge article about coding and the NGSS, and I highly recommend reading it, um, and just some of how you can meet those standards with coding. So one of the th thing that teachers ask us a lot is, okay, I'm on board, That's, that sounds great, how do I get started? And so when Jason and I started coding together with my K-1 class, um, I had a light situation to yours there too. Oh. <laughs> it's a little bit different. <laughs> when Jason and I started coding with my K-1 class at Lamont, it was really just started with the decision to start, you know, and, and just carving out some time each week to make it happen. Um, we had a tech time that we taught together and we were doing different skills. And so it was easy for us to use that tech time to have the kids do their coding. Um, but I found such great application for it in our math time as well, that Jason and I would maybe teach them to use the, the skills during our tech time. And then I would move it into the centers during our math time. So when kids weren't meeting with me, they were using devices and also going through their coding programs. And that gave them just a little bit more time because once they got started in tech, they didn't want to stop. <laughs> so promising to do it later in math. And I think that would be easily easy for you to do because Angela gets them started in your tech class and it wouldn't be hard for them to pick it back up again in uh, math or science rotation as well. Yep. It'd work great for math, especially because we have, I have a I do daily three for math. Yeah. Yeah. So it could just be part of their choices. Yep. 
Yep. And they, and you, and it works nicely if you're sharing devices too, like you are. So mm -hmm. then just, and they can do it in teams or they can do it by themselves. And it really depends on the kids. Um, you're in a cool situation because Angela is doing the hour of code with all the classes in Amsterdam this year. Um, and she has for the last few years, it sounds like. Um, the hour of code was meant to just get people started and they, they obviously want you to code after this first week in December, but it's supposed to just be a kickoff event that is sort of the introduction to what it is, getting the kids excited about the idea that they would accumulate enough hours to say that they coded for an hour. Um, and so that's what she's doing with all of the classes. I think I'm gonna watch her teach your class tomorrow, Kim. Um, I have tech tomorrow. Okay, maybe I'll we'll come with them. Yeah, yeah, you should come over and, and watch them do it. Um, and then, as I said, you, it moves in nicely to learning centers. And then we actually, because we did a genius hour in my class, some kids chose to continue that work during their genius hour time. Um, okay. And there are some higher level things that we can show you for those kids that really get it and really want to take it further. And other kids um, just like the game aspect of it. Um, and I should back up there. I think Jason and I realized when we first started, it would have been real easy to just put the games in front of them and let them play. And the games were intuitive enough that they were engaging and fun and the kids could figure out how to do them without ever knowing they were actually coding. <laughs> so <laughs> that's where that direct instruction piece was important to me as a teacher because I wanted them to understand why they were playing these games and what they were learning as a result of it. Um, and so it's, it, I'm really, I'm really excited that most, uh, that all the kids in Amsterdam understand what coding is. They all understand what computer science is and that's because it's being done in their tech. So, um, it's, it's been a cool thing that she started. So then we've got some resources we suggest, and this is our list of things in the K2 classroom. The first one is an iPad app put out by PBS Kids and it's called Scratch, PBS Kids Scratch Junior. And this is um, really intended for the K3 kids, but I've had success using it with fourth and fifth graders as well. And it allows the kids to code PBS characters to move. Um, they, can, they can put in a different background. They can put the wild crats up there. They can put the animals in there and then they can code them to interact and move with one another. Um, this also has a curriculum that goes with it. So there are lesson plans that are scaffolded nicely and a teacher can walk the kids through. It also has non-tech coding activities. We call them unplugged activities. And sequencing and activities for following directions and for figuring out repeated patterns and the, the repeated um, part, parts of coding. All of that can be done with a various unplugged activities. Codable is the one that Jason and I used with the K1 kiddos, and it's both iPad and Chromebook. And I think Angela has been using it with kindergarten and first graders at Amsterdam. Okay. So they would be very familiar with that one. And then code.org is the one Jason was just on. And that's the one that probably is the easiest to use as far as you get the kids logged in, you choose their grade level, and let them choose which kind of which kind of game they want to play. We've got Frozen for the kids who love Frozen. We've got Star Wars for the Star Wars fans. Um, there's something for everybody on code.org. Code.org also has a really nice scaffolded set of lesson plans that includes your unplugged things using coordinate grids, things that will tie in nicely with what you're doing with math. You're probably mm -hmm. teaching coding in some aspect in your math program and not even realizing it. Mm -hmm. And then Tinker is both an app on the iPad as well as um, a web-based program that also allows for coding. And that was the one Angela was using with the sixth graders today. Um, but there is, she's got them working at a very high level with that one, but mm -hmm. I had kiddos working at a, at a, in K1 using that one too. There's still um, younger age ones for that one too. There was one that was like a Monster High theme that all my kids absolutely loved. <laughs> I think Monster High is gross, but <laughs> very popular. Which guarantees it's you know, exciting for them. <laughs> Why they're drawn to it, yes. <laughs> this next slide is for kids in three through eight. Um, and the one we add here is a Google CS First. 
And this one, I've learned more about it, and I thought it was brand new, but apparently it's been around for a few years now. And it's intended actually for teachers who are going to do an after-school program, where oh. kids might learn to code in an after-school program. Um, and they'll actually send you materials and, and give you things that go along with that. But what I liked about this one, and I would still use it um, even for little ones, because I'll just show it to you here. We explore the curriculum. It's every uh, lesson begins with a video. And the video is someone who works at Google talking about their job at Google. So if we want to talk about career connections, um, just these videos alone, I think are really interesting. So you would play this video and then the kids can go through these different scenarios to make the Google logo. And I'm thinking if you've got some higher level kiddos that want to do a Genius Hour project, this would be a really nice place for them to explore. Yeah, I wish I had known about that when I did. Yeah. The coding club. Right. And I don't know that it was around when you were doing the coding club at Lamont. I think it's it's Not still that old. Yeah. 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 I was like in the ice age, you know. <laughs> 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 so these are some tablet apps. I talked about a lot of them. Jason and I used uh, Lightbot quite a bit. Yeah. Um, when they finished Codable, we'd move them into Lightbot and that had more of a three dimensional aspect and um, really got their I would say they're directional, just that had, they, a lot of them would have to get up and move because they, they're having to rotate things and having to, I'm trying to, I'm using my hand. Spatial, to to spatial awareness. There you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Obviously not my strength because I can't even <laughs> get the words out. <laughs> um, Osmo has come out with a coding program too that I loved. And of course it costs money, but, um, we use that one quite a bit. You're not getting to click that link. I'm not going to get to click that link because the slides won't let me. Here we go. There, there we go. Um, it would be one of those things that if uh, the parent group had a little bit of money, <laughs> that would be fun. But you put the iPad in this base and the red, the red uh, mirror throws an image down here and she's going to use these little blocks to build code and then hit the play button and the monster on the screen moves around. Um, and we used that at Lamont and it was a get awesome. other center activity. And it was very engaging all the way up to, I mean, fourth and fifth graders really loved it because it got really te technical. But it's, the blocks is a very hands-on way for them to figure out how to problem solve and figure out coding. Um, and that's good if with only having one iPad in the room and Osmo is a really cool way to incorporate the iPad into the center. There's a lot of activities on Osmo that aren't just coding things too. Okay. Go back here. How, how much, you said, how expensive is it? Well, um, I want to say the Osmo pack it anymore is like maybe I don't know, 50 or 60 bucks to get started with like the little base. Um, the apps come free. And then I think that coding piece um, was another like 30 or 40. It wasn't bad to just buy one to look that up. We just got some parent, some money from our fundraiser. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's the and kind of thing. Let's see. Not enough to buy a new iPad, but maybe something like this would be a good way to yeah, to use the iPad you already have. So um, it's 108 for the whole little kit. Um, it looks like the coding family. So there's a couple different ones. Or you could get here, this one, you've got your Tanagrams and your letter tiles and your dice and then this little racer thing for 149 Or you can get just your basic pack for $99. Um, and then you can add any of these coding things. So the coding one is 59 once you've bought the base. I bought this monster thing for my daughter last year. Um, and it's cool because they draw on this whiteboard and then the monster reaches down and grabs their drawings and plays with them. In the screen. It's wow. really fun. Um, it is just a whiteboard though. So for $49, <laughs> I'm, on a, I'm still like kicking myself a little. Like, <laughs> but she really likes the, it. The pen's special <laughs> in any way or the town? Yeah. 
not really. No, it just fits okay. up nicely against the base. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> um, That's good to know because you never know, you know, when you're yeah. spending that, you're like, is this worth it or is it not worth it? Right. And I, I mean, I imagine is something special in the whiteboard and how the, the mirror and the reflection, it probably does work better than a regular whiteboard, although I'd like to try it and see. <laughs> to see. <laughs> But I suppose you can't get it at all without the whiteboard. <laughs> right, right. Well, I think you can download the apps, but I'm sure you'd have to pay for them. So I'm not sure. We'll have to try it. I'll bring it in sometime and you guys can try okay. it. Um, but then these these are the, the apps that would work on Chromebooks, or those are tablet apps, and then these are our um, web-based ones. Lightbot and Codable are also there. And then there's the BrainPop games are all, are all free. You don't need a subscription to use the coding games on BrainPop. Okay. Which is really nice. So a lot of options to just try. And I think there's so many now that it, it's not hard to just pick one and let your kids get started. Um, yeah. And a lot of them, I like code.org just because it has them log in with their Google account. So then they can save their progress. Whereas mm -hmm. some of these others, they might have to start over every time. Okay. Jason, did you have one that you wanted to add or did you think of it or? Scratch.edu. Okay. Just occurred to me. So Scratch, the PBS Scratch Junior, that's, that's a, the iPad, right? That's just a mobile. Yeah. So that's, that was based on Scratch Junior, which was based on Scratch dot edu okay which is made by mit and it is a sandbox i mean it's very similar it's just a more advanced version of the the scratch junior and of course you know I have cool things like peg plus cat but um <laughs> not showing my favorites um, <laughs> but but for older students that's what i teach in the summertime for parks and rec um where we get some some older students in there um any yeah probably fourth grade and up would be my recommendation so that's a great open-ended tool and you can create an account and save your work well and there's a scratch junior which isn't the pbs one but scratch junior is on chromebooks oh and it so is okay. it's like the primary version of scratch yeah. um and so that's another, I think that's another really good one too. Okay. I should probably add that one too. All right. Um, and then these are just some other resources for you to check out another time. A lot of these are either blog posts that um, just give you a little bit more background about coding. Um, this is a, a video collection that would introduce just computers and how they work to the kiddos. Seesaw actually did a really cool this thing this year and they did a whole coding series where they did some webinars and some interviews with the people who worked for the company to talk about um, how coding Ooh. helps them in creating Seesaw. So they did a jobs in computer science, girls who code. And so a lot of these are happening right now as we speak. <laughs> so, um, but I'm sure the recordings will be there later um, to just learn a little bit more. I thought it was kind of a neat thing for a company to do. Um, but then they've got design thinking, how do you build an app? Um, this is all great things that kids are really interested in because they're using apps so much. Um, and then they've got some other resources on here for using coding. So I thought it was really neat that they put that together for Hour of Code. Um, and Khan Academy has a pretty good coding lesson series. I don't, nobody can put me to sleep quite like Sal Khan, but, um, so I don't always is recommend that so? his stuff. Yeah, so. but it, it is a pretty kid friendly series and that would allow them to log in as well. Um, and with that, we've come to the end of the things that we wanted to talk about. This is the link that you can click on to fill out an evaluation. And then from there, we'll, we'll mail you or email you an OPI renewal unit. Um, do you have any questions for us about any no, of them that we shared? This is great. I'm looking forward to trying some of them out. Yeah. 
yeah, be fun. So, and I'll, I'll be in the building for the rest of the week too. So we okay. can, if something comes up too. So, yeah. um, but service. thank you. You betcha. Yeah, we appreciate <laughs> Sorry it. Sorry I'm your lone participant. Yeah. Oh, we're glad. <laughs> we're glad that you're here. Otherwise we would have just talked to each other the whole time. So it gave us <laughs> a little bit more purpose behind our discussion. <laughs> Deal. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks so much for your time. Thanks, you Kim. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. All right. I'm going to stop the recording. Nope, that's not what I wanted to do. Stop the share. And now.